Hello, everyone. Thanks so much for your patience. Uh, my name is Bill Cardalopoulos. I'm the programming uh, director for the MOCA Festival. Uh, I'm so glad you're here with us today. Um, and uh, this is our Mark Allen Stamity Spotlight. I have so much that I want to talk uh, to Mark about today. But before we do anything else, please join me in welcoming Mark here. Yeah. Free applause, great. Thank you. <laughs> Um, we're here today um, uh, in part because there is a, a brand new edition of Mark Allen Stamity's classic book, McDoodle Street. And this is published by New York Review Comics, uh, the comics imprint of New York Review Books. Uh, so that's what brings Mark here to MOCA as a featured guest this year. He's been signing books over at the stand, and we'll be doing that uh, again later today. Um, and I wanted to talk to Mark about MacDoodle Street, which is such an amazing book that I've loved for so long, and I'm so happy that people are um, having a chance to experience it again. But before we do that, I just kind of wanted to understand a little better, like, where MacDoodle Street came from and what the context of it was. Um, one of the things that comes up a lot in your biographies, the various bios I've seen of you, Mark, is that you, and I think Jules Pfeiffer mentions this in his introduction to MacDoodle Street, and it's it's the same introduction that was in the edition that came out mm -hmm. in, I think, was it 1980? 1980 or? was the, f he first wrote that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that you are a, um, a very special case of a second generation cartoonist, right? Both of your parents yeah. were also cartoonists? Both of my parents were single panel gag cartoonists in the magazines from the 40s, 50s, 60s. They met in art school. My father actually was from Greek restaurant people and uh, in Cincinnati. And um, when he was 15, the doctor told him he had a heart condition. He gave him the terrible advice of the time, which is, you should have a sedentary profession. So like right then, in the doctor's office, my father said, I'll be a cartoonist. And um, he it went to It seems like something that would happen in MacDoodle Street. <laughs> right. So it's in my heritage. In my, it's probably just genetic. You know, that I, but what happened um, then, then um, my mother, he met my mother in Cincinnati Art Academy, and they, uh, and he got her into it. So... And she did teenage cartoons. She had a character, Sitter Sue. She had a character, Ginny, who was in a lot of uh, like teen magazines. And sometimes Ladies Home Journal, sometimes uh, Saturday Evening Post. My father, anyway, there were a lot of magazines then. So I grew up around that. And I, and I read a lot of um, uh, cartoon books, like collections of sim single panel cartoons. So I, I, you know, I had that coming out of my ears. And, and, and you know, I read comics, comic books, et cetera. But when I was um, uh, 14, I, I discovered Jules Pfeiffer, 666. And he was doing things with uh, comics that um, I'd never seen before. And, and, and one thing I realized is that I was interested in narrative, um, not just, uh, you know, single panel gags. And, and I liked the way, guy, you know, the characters would just begin speaking and they would come out of that. And it wasn't all about just like the joke, the punchline. And, um, and then, uh, so I went to Cooper Union, and, um, and uh, in my years at Cooper Union, when, when I was in high school, actually, I started kind of taking long walks at night in New Jersey. And when I was um, at Cooper Union, I continued that. And those were kind of years where I was really searching for myself. And I'd say half of my education at Cooper Union was just New York City. And I used to like go on these and long what year, walks. And what years were the? What years are you talking so about? So I, I went. It was uh, 1965 to 1969. That's an incredible time to have been wandering around New York City. Yeah, it was think, great. Like it was a young great. person. I mean, what? I think any time has its pleasures and, and interests, but just in terms of so many cultural things that were happening, and I, I guess the accessibility of all that too. Yeah, it was, well, you know, a, a lot of what New York is about is just, just the streets, just what, you know, and, and the energy of it. I don't, I was always drawn to the energy of the streets. So that, you know, Cooper Union is at the top of the Bowery, too, so, which was the Bowery then, with, you know, what we called Bowery bums and whatever. And, and actually, the guru of, of um, McDoodle Street is Eddie Reddy. And Eddie Reddy, I changed the spelling of his name, was actually an actual guy that um, one night I was, uh, late at night, I was walking down, um, so probably in the early 70s at that point maybe, I was walking across uh, St. Mark's Place 
And there was a guy, um, there was like an old mattress that this guy was sort of trying to sleep on. And he was about like a 50 year old guy or something. And um, I just passed by, but later I saw him walking around. So I took a long walk with him and I basically got his life story, which was interesting. And um, anyway, he ended up being the guru of, um, of, um, of uh, McDoodle Street. Uh, although that doesn't look exactly like him. I could say more about Eddie Reddy, but uh, <laughs> but basically in those walks at night, I would just say, I like to say I was that that I, I we had a teacher at Cooper Union named Ben Cunningham who was an op artist, and he said I am a visual voluptuary. And we had him freshman year, and uh, so I began. So I you know I did I I had you know big ambitions. I wanted to conquer the world. I wanted to do great things. You know, so I so I had this kind of desire and I didn't was kind of unformed I didn't know exactly what I wanted to do but I had a feeling about the city and about in in those walks at night I kind of felt like the the night was kind of magical and that and that um, and I just um, I would basically I would feel like my eyes and my brain were tools and my heart center was kind of like soft clay and I would and I would allow myself to be guided. So it's kind of like a mystical thing. It was kind of like my intuition just and I'd allow it to guide me to take in visual things, people, everything, and just kind of make these imprints here. Because in my work I want to feel it here. And then I want to put it on paper and have other people feel it here. So um, so I was just absorbing and it was kind of a just a magical thing unto it unto itself taking that in. So I just absorbed, absorbed, absorbed the city. And, and toward the end of my time at Cooper Union, I started drawing city pictures, you know, street, pictures of the streets. I always liked very detailed things. I always liked about the city that there's just so much happening all the time. And, um, and, and that's a lot of what McDoodle Street is about. Um, and I, I guess maybe I'll just say one other thing about this, that and at Cooper Union, there was there was not a particular appreciation of commercial art, even though the the gods the the, the gods of among the alumni were you know like basically a pushpin you know Milton Glaser who lived a half a block from the school at that time and you know Seymour Quast Ed Sorrell whatever they were sort of the gods in some way but it was but none of our teachers cared about that our teachers were all kind of fine artists except for a couple but but. Um, and so, but that, but in a way that was good. So I didn't get a lot of encouragement about, you know, cartooning or anything commercial. That was all kind of like, but I, but I got very absorbed in fine art. I got very absorbed. I'd go to music, you know, if I, if I, like if I, if I felt kind of lost and down or whatever, those walks would kind of lift me. And also I, if I felt lost and down in the daytime, I go to the Met from Paulette Museum of Art. I'd go to the Modern I'd, and basically and, and, and that would kind of, um, you know, that would uh, uh, feed me. And, and so, so in doing McDoodle Street, um, I felt like I wanted, to, uh, I wanted to kind of approach comic a comic strip from the outside. I wanted to approach it like bring to it, like what could a comic strip be? So a comic strip, you know, is kind of like an organism. That's why the comic strip became a character in the comic strip, unfortunately. Comic strip had a drinking problem. I didn't realize that would happen. V various things like that happened. And so the comic strip got drunk in the comic strip. You can imagine how embarrassing that was for me. <laughs> things like that. And um, so I tried to, you know, uh, you know, I t r rather than like being somebody who traced Little Abner for 20 years and then was doing this, I wanted to just come from like the. You know, at least my notion was to come at it from the outside. Um, between the time you uh, graduated um, Cooper Union and uh, you did McDoodle Street in The Voice in the uh, later 70s, um, you produced a bunch of other work. And the, the main things that I'm aware of are several children's books. Um, one is a book called Yellow Yellow okay. that I actually just read for the first time. And that's also coming out soon in a new edition it's from being, Drawn yeah, and Quarterly. It's being reprinted right? by Drawn and Quarterly. They have a, mm -hmm. they call it, they're, they're, their whatever you call it is in font, en but font. it's it's yeah. en font. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but but French um, Canadian publisher. So I went yeah. to I went to um, <laughs> Cooper Union with a, and and I met a guy there named Frank Ash who's made like a hundred children's books or close to it. Um, and he's a real genius with children. He was getting books published, kids books published when we were in um, Cooper Union and. Uh, 
I'll, I'll try to tell this little vignette as quickly as I can, but basically um, I was in an exercise class one, one night and, um, and uh, the woman next, I was still in art school, and the woman next to me said, what do you do? And I said, um, I, uh, I'm an artist. And she said, well, you should go see my friend Bob. So I t I, my mother had thrown like every drawing I'd ever done in some big old portfolio thing. And I, you know, I lugged this thing up to this office on Madison Avenue. I had no idea where I was. I didn't know who Bob was. I went to see Bob I, and, he, and he, he opens this thing up and he's looking through these things and say, oh, this is great. Oh, this is great. This is great. And every now and then he'd say, I'm going to use you. And then he goes, great, great, great. I'm going to use you. I'm thinking, Use me for what? Mop up your office? I what? Are you, who who are you? What is this? I never really. I didn't know. Anyway, he had my number, and I and then I took my portfolio back to Cooper Union. Sit. I was sitting in the cafeteria. Along comes Frank. He sits down. And he says, uh, "Is that your stuff?" He says, "Yeah, yeah." I said, "Let me see your stuff." So he's looking through it, and he's already published two kids' books that he wrote and drew. He said, "Hey, you want to draw a kids' book?" So I said, uh, yeah, you bet I would. So, so that eventually became yellow, yellow after a few, I, I won't explain Frank's personality in, at this point, but anyway, we, got, we, end, we ended up that I was gonna do yellow, yellow, and he had a very minimal kind of a little couple of lines that indicated what, what it was about. Um, it, it, I, it's, it's a very out. visual book. I mean, it's got a very small amount of text and so much yeah. is about where the color well, is, is and, and where it's coming from and what it's doing. This was my chance to put the city in, the bo in a mm -hmm. book, you know, first time. So, yeah, so I, I used it for that. He meant it to be a policeman. I meant for it to be a, I, I thought he meant a construction worker. So that's what I did. And there's another story about that. But then, so then, anyway, that happened. Actually, I'll say this quickly. We have, so... I delivered this book on May, May I, I, so Frank wanted, Frank saw that I was making it a construction worker. He said, no, I, it was a policeman. This is about the 68 riots in Chicago, and I want to make this political statement. I said, Frank, I don't want to make a political kid's book. Now, this is about destiny, okay? So I don't want to make this, so he said, okay, so I made it a construction worker. I delivered this book on May 1st, 1970, to the office of McGraw-Hill, had lunch with the with the editor, I walk downtown, I go in the new school graduate building on 14th Street, um, I walk in there, the students have taken it over because Nixon has just bombed, um, Han what did he bomb, uh, Cambodia. So, and the students have taken over the place. I went in there to see my friend Wilbur who was working as a teacher assistant. And I said to Wilbur, and so anyway, I, I walk up to Wilbur and Wilbur says, hey, you know what just happened? At, at City Hall, there was a peace demonstration, and suddenly a bunch of construction workers attacked the demonstrators <laughs> that day. <laughs> so, and, it, and somebody out in the Midwest was really upset about this political kids' book, you know, but anyway, <laughs> when it came out. But um, so the other thing about it is that I just, um, uh, so, that, so then also, then two years after. I, I ran into Frank, and um, I was out of school, living on McDougal Street. Out of the blue, my phone rings. You know, there were no answering service back then. If you weren't, I didn't have any, you know, there's no, if, if, you missed, if you weren't home, you missed it, you know? So I pick up the phone. Hi, this is Bob Hagel. It's Bob. He's calling <laughs> me. He said, I tried to reach you last summer. I couldn't get you. I wanted you to do a full page ad in the New York Times, but I missed you. So, so he said. So he said. Um, but I, I want you to do these Hilton Hotel ads. So I, anyway, I ended up doing like a bunch of Hilton Hotel ads, and that actually gave me the money to get through Who Needs Donuts, which I had then started working on because I was pretty broke. You know, I didn't have much of an advance. So. Anyway, so it all came around and went around. So because I saw Bob, I ran into Frank with my portfolio. Because I saw Bob, I had the money to get through McDougal Street. So this is what I tell all young people, and it may be applicable to anybody. The most important advice that I can ever give you, if you're ever in an exercise class, and the woman next to you says, what do you do? And you say, I'm an artist. And she says, well, you should go see my friend Bob. The most important advice I could ever give you is go. C. Bob. <laughs> um, 
And you just mentioned uh, uh, Who Needs Donuts. This is a book that came out in 73, and I think this is the first one you wrote and drew yourself. Is that true? Yeah, it was, exactly. And this is a book that's still in print today. I mean, I consider... Well, it was out, you know, it was out of print for a while, and during sure. that period, somebody bought one for over Amazon. I sold one to... Some, I, I put it up at one point on Amazon for $500, and somebody in California bought one. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, so it was a kind of out of print collector's item. It for came a while. back in two thousand three, which was then the thirtieth anniversary. Okay, know. but since then it's been in print. Yeah, I think it's been publishers... doing well. It's actually it's been doing quite well. Yeah, and this is a really beautiful book. I mean, and and uh, you know what this is right here, by the way. No. Well, it's no. It's a, <laughs> well, that's the that's the background. It's a picture of a giraffe. <laughs> Did you know where the you, Bill? You know where the giraffe is. You need to find it. I'll show you. I'll show you where the giraffe is. Oh, it's buried. There's a little tiny giraffe sticking its head out of there. Um, well, I think that's what. Yeah, and I this one of the things that's great about this book is that there is so much to look at, and you know, you mentioned like bringing the city into yellow, yellow, and this is something that you also did in. Who needs donuts as well, right? This is right yeah. Book. I mean, what is this picture of? Um, well, that's Sam first arriving in the city, but mm -hmm. that's basically, you know, I wanted to, I wanted to capture that feeling of the energy of the city. I've always loved the just the infinite activity and the craziness and the kind of hilarity of it and the complexity of it. So that's kind mm -hmm. of what I was you know, driving at. Yeah, this there. is just like a little detail, just so people can see how much is in there. And I guess, you know, there, and there was a woman, th this came from, um, I always carry a sketchbook, I always, I always have some, and, then, and uh, my second year in art school, um, I used to hang out, and I used to, well, when I was wandering around the streets and stuff, I'd also sit places and listen to what would go on, and there was an all-night coffee shop, a Bickford's coffee shop on 23rd and 3rd, that had this kind of winding, uh, whatever you call this, um, um, counter, no tables. And all these crazy people would be in there at night. And I'd always, you know, so anyway, one night I walked in there and there was an old woman, was like kind of asleep over the counter like this. And, um, and I sat down and, I, and it was there for a while. She was like that for a while. And then at some point a guy comes in, he said, I'd like two cups of coffee to go. And the waitress said, would you like donuts with your coffee? And, and he said, no, thank you. And suddenly the sad old woman picked up her head, pointed at the plastic light fixture on the ceiling and said, that's right, who needs donuts when you've got love? And, uh, <laughs> and I wrote that in my thing. And then I, I was living, it, before I moved to McDougal Street in 68, I, for the first three years I lived in, in this boarding house that used to be, you didn't have to be religious, had 20 men and 20 women in Calvary Episcopal Church. It's this building behind Cal, it was on Gramercy Park. And, um, and I put that, a big sign on my wall. It said, that's right, who needs when you got love? And, and people would walk in my room and they say, oh, that's funny. And then when I was on McDougal Street, and I, after I did Yellow Yellow, I wanted to write a, a book. And I wrote a couple of terrible things. And then, I, and then I, I kept trying to write my own book. And I looked around my apartment, I thought, I want to write something that has a meaning to me. I saw that and I thought, I want to make that famous. <laughs> so. um, and you did some other uh, kids' books, but I'd like to sort of um, talk uh, about the, how that making work for kids, uh, how you sort of transitioned from making work for kids to making work for the you know, presumed adult readers of The Voice. Um, but, and I think some, some of the link has something to do with your interest in, in drawing the city. I think that sort of was the bridge, as I understand mm -hmm. it, to you going from making kids' books to making work for adults. I was actually looking for um, some voice covers that would have been from around the period your work first started appearing. And I found these ones. These are from like 77 and 79. And I was just so amazed at like this 79 cover that I just stumbled on <laughs> using Google image search was about how terrible Donald Trump yeah, was we, in 1979. We've all known that forever, <laughs> how terrible he is. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, and it's just like, yeah, he's just a sleazy developer who's the son of a sleazy developer. And that's the story on this yeah. guy in 1979. And uh 
you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. well, <laughs> it's 40 years later, things are a little different. Um, but uh, I, from what I understand, and maybe I don't quite have this chronology right, the first things that you did for The Voice were these large city landscapes, right? Yeah, what, um, yeah, what, well, I, the, actually, the very first thing, I did some illustrations for them, uh-huh. but, um, but basically, um, you know, in kids' books, there were things I really couldn't put in a kid's book. There was a, just a more adult way that I, you know, that a lot that, that just didn't didn't fit a kid's book. Mm-hmm. And I and I, you know, I'd been a fan of Pfeiffer since you know fourteen. And when I first came to the city, I always read Pfeiffer every week there. And 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 I I just I read The Voice every week, and I just kept my eye on it. And they started opening up. They had more comic strips, and then they started um, they started having their um, their um, centerfold, uh, like doing different things with it every week. So I went to The Voice and I pitched this. I told them I wanted a, I wanted a regular feature, but, uh, but I, I also pitched this idea. I wanted to do, draw Greenwich Village. This is Times Square, but I want to draw oh, yeah, Greenwich, Greenwich Village, Village in the style of Who Needs Donuts. Yeah. Mm. And so, um, so, I, so I did that, and... Um, and it went over really well, and uh, and because it went over so well, uh, they gave me a little strip like this, which is in the beginning of um, of McDoodle Street, the book. You see here, some of the early goo. <laughs> yeah, garbledy goo is what I called it originally. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and um, and um, a, a few anyway, a few of them got ended up getting reprinted in Playboy because they came and got a bunch of us cartoonists for some comics page. Then they wanted to use the characters, so then. So then I, I wouldn't let them do that. But anyway, um, so some of them are called Adventures of Herbert Hippo. But basically, um, uh, I, I did that, I did that um, Greenwich Village, and then I did Times Square. And, um, and then uh, and two cartoonists left uh, The Voice to go to a, a briefly, re, uh, a brief, very version of... Um, of uh, Esquire magazine. So suddenly there were two openings. So right away, the art director called me up and said, if you want to do this, you know, make an appointment with the editor. And I went to meet, Mary, meet with Marianne, the editor, and she said, well, you can show me something. So I took two weeks and started writing McDoodle Street. I came back, had a meeting. I threw two, the first two episodes on her desk, and then I started just throwing random characters on, on the desk. Sold American. So that, that's how it started. Mm. Yeah, and McDoodle Street is such a fantastic strip. One of the things that's really striking about it, and it's so important that it was reprinted, because in a way, I don't know if this was even on your mind at the time, but it almost feels like it was destined to be a book. Because when, when, well, <laughs> well just, I wrote it to be a book. I, you see, I wanted to write novels with words and pictures, and mm. I'd wanted to do that for a long time. So I had this ulterior thing, and about 10 weeks into it, actually, I got, it got signed as a book, when, mm. you know, some, but I wrote it as a weekly strip and as a novel. I see. Yeah, because that's the thing I was going to say that really, like we did an exhibit um, uh, several years ago at the Society of Illustrators that included your work about alt-weekly comics, essentially. And, I mean, that's something that sort of you, you know, you could you could argue started in the fifties with Pfeiffer, but it took almost like twenty or so years before there was actually a whole body of other people doing that. You kind mean of graphic stuff. novels? No, no, no I mean what? the alt weekly comic strip. Oh yeah, oh yeah. You know, because well, it was really yeah. Pfeiffer and the Voice for a long time. Yeah, then a couple exactly. of other people, I guess, like yeah, Stan Mack and maybe Ed Sorrell. I'm not sure. Yeah, you know, the Voice. Well, after the, I mean the the you know. Clay Felker, who started New York Magazine, buying um, buying The Voice had its pluses and its minuses. But one of its pluses was he opened up to more comic strips. If he hadn't done that, he opened and he put more money into it, mm-hmm. and uh, so there was more opportunity there. For before um, before that happened, it was basically there was Pfeiffer and, and I'm trying to remember the name. He mentions the name in, in the it was someone else. There was a guy who did Mac. a little a little one panel, and I think was. it was just Pfeiffer and him for okay. many years. So it opened up with under Clay Felker, and then mm-hmm. you know they didn't, you know they tried to get Crumb to do it. Crumb did it about. Um, Right. 10 weeks and couldn't stand doing yeah, it weekly. Yeah yeah. yeah, 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 that's right. I've seen those. But what's striking about this is that um, uh, you, what, you, what really distinguishes your work, and I don't think people really even did this again until, you know, uh, maybe like the 90s or something, is that like right from the beginning, 
you were telling a continuing story. You were really kind of, I mean, each strip is satisfying on its own, both visually and narratively. Um, and especially each one really has visual integrity with the borders and, uh, you know, the kind of decorative compositional elements and everything. But it does tell a story and it's a coherent and continuous story, even if it kind of branches off in quite a few different directions. And that's really unusual. I mean, you don't really see that. In a way, it's, I guess, in the tradition of the, the newspaper comic strip in some ways, although by the 70s that wasn't even so typical of newspaper comic strips, but the kind of heyday, if you think of the heyday of the 1930s, 40s. Orphan Annie, Steve Yeah, Little Orphan Annie, those, yeah, Chester Gould, Dick Tracy, stories. Milton yeah. Kniff, all that kind yeah. of stuff. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, and I was just kind of wondering why it is that you, like, from literally strip one, were, you know, launching into this narrative. Because I wanted to write novels. Yeah. That's yeah, really, that's yeah, basically yeah. it. I, wanted, visual, to, you I wanted, wanted this to, do graphic to be a novels, book. Essentially, when nobody, what? You wanted to do graphic novels, even yeah. though nobody was making graphic novels. And I thought that, yeah, and I thought yeah. that, yeah, originally I called this a comic strip novel. Mm -hmm. I didn't even, the gra graphic novel term, I don't know, I guess it came around in the 80s more, I don't know. But, um, um, yeah, so that's, um, that, that was basically my... Um, my motive. Mm -hmm. One of the things that's really funny too that struck me as I was reading this is right from the beginning on the very first uh, page of the book or the very first strip in the series, the sort of nominal villains are this group called, um, is it the Conservative, the Conservative Liberation, Liberation Front? Front. Yeah, yeah, and it's these people who are they're kind of busting into a beatnik kind of cafe yeah. and protesting because the cafe has a policy where you're not allowed to wear ties and you have to have a beard. So they're coming in and they're wearing like three ties. And But it's like, what's so funny about this is that it, what must have seemed like an inversion at the time of like, the conservatives acting like the protesting radicals well, is kind of like the tone now of the entire conservative movement, which is based on this feeling of aggrievement and even when they're in power, you know, yeah. the things like the Tea Party and, and stuff that came out, you know, because has sort of emerged in the last 10 or so years. I mean, so it feels, I mean, almost like weirdly predictive in that it's way. It's funny how that, yeah, I, well, you know, when I, when I was a kid, a lot of people were upset when uh, Barry Goldwater got the Republican president presidential nomination. People thought Ronald Reagan would blow up the world. When I started this strip, um, there, Jimmy Carter was the president and he, he might have been 60% in the polls, but he wasn't in, you know, he wasn't really in trouble, I don't believe, at that point. Nobody thought Ronald Reagan would be the next president. And, um, and, and, um, so, and also, this is, this is the astonishing thing. This is why, you know, there's just, there just are larger forces of, of knowledge in the universe that sometimes reach us. I had no idea that Wayne Newton was going to sing at the 1980 Republican convention. Right. No and, idea. And a big that plot point I here. I couldn't stand Wayne Newton when he was 11 on the Ed Sullivan show. <laughs> I thought he was like, I'd never even seen his Las Vegas personality. I, you know, he, he got this different voice and this kind of sleazy thing and the mustache. And all. I didn't know. He, I knew the goody two shoes guy on Ed Sullivan. I couldn't stand him. Anyway, I didn't know that was all going to happen. Yeah, and one of the plot points is that your main character, uh, Malcolm Frazzle, kind of angers the conservatives by yeah, insulting he didn't like, Wayne uh, Newton. Yeah, he didn't yeah, like Wayne yeah. Newton. Um, there's so much in this comic strip. And like you were saying before, one of the things that's really great is this feeling that the comic strip itself is kind of one of the characters in the book. You know, so sometimes, like, the comic strip gets upset by the digressions and the little marginal <laughs> drawings start charging into the comic strip or you'll have these episodes where it says sometimes a comic strip just gets in a mood and you fill the page with doodles and kind of would, when we would when you would do something like this was it um in a way because it was reflecting your own uh feeling about addressing the story or what your own artistic interests might have been that week or is that well, I just, I'd say I wanted, I wanted the, I, I, you know, I wanted the strip to wander. You know, Malcolm mm -hmm. Frazzle's favorite philosopher, Thomas Onion, believes deeply in dawdling and mm -hmm. kind of wandering around and not knowing where you're headed and finding your way. Like, and so there, so I basically wanted this strip to, to, this is where the comic strip gets drunk. Mm -hmm. and, and, and then it gets in, a, at some point it gets in a, in, a, in a bar, he gets in a fight with a classified ad that he thinks is really <laughs> stupid. <laughs> um, but the, um, so, um, uh, so I, I, it was, it was, 
I guess it's like it's just an intuitive thing. I wanted the comic strip to kind of be this restless organism. Um, I wanted to have, you know, whatever threads, I wanted them to, you know, ultimately have some coherence, but I really wanted it to be kind of, um, um, yeah, uh, go its go its find its way in its peculiar way. Mm -hmm. This is an episode where the comic is, strip yeah. itself takes inventory of everything that's been happening so far. So it's taken inventory of the characters. And yeah. Um, and one of the other things that um, is really exciting reading through this again is kind of the mix of visual styles sometimes too. I mean, sometimes you have these like very kind of moody, rendered, surreal sorts of images. And yeah, I had fun with this image when, you know, it's upside down there, but I had fun with oh, that. Oh, no, image. is the image No, 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 oh, the, no, the comic strip here is right side up. Oh, I see. No, no, you did it correctly. Oh, okay. No, no, it's just that, oh, that you, the image is, right, right, you right. have to kind of turn around to see the image exactly. But anyway, that, that, that's, um, but yeah, I, well, that's, that's the thing about, I, I you know, I spent a lot of time in other worlds that weren't comic strips, and I kind of wanted to bring other things to it. So, mm -hmm. so I, you know, I was hoping for as wide a, you know, influence um, reference mm -hmm. thing as I could manage. And I also thought that your um, when you were talking about Cooper Union and the philosophies of the teachers, it made me think that maybe your um, your character, uh, what's his name, Gustav Ranto? Did I remember that right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Gustav Ranto. He's yeah. like this this. Uh, painter who drinks, you know, like dozens of cups of cappuccino <laughs> to work himself up into like his anger about art and so on. I, I got the impression when you were talking, maybe like this character was sort of a parody of some of the attitudes you encountered in art school. Is that yeah, yeah, maybe was, true uh, or not? I'd say, yeah, I'd say that, um, uh, yeah, and, and there, I mean, you know, we all wanted to be geniuses and we all wanted to, and, and you know, this is the thing that I mean, I think, you know, do you ever, if you ever think about yourself as a youth and then you're like horrified, you know, like, like, well, I thought, geez, you know, Van Gogh, that's not great. You know, he, he had, he, he, he suffered and he, and it, and, and he died and he wasn't recognized, but he f pursued that truth in it. You know, I'm all for, I do, I believe in pursuing the truth and everything, but I don't mind paying my rent too. And, and, mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, I had a, so, so Gustav was kind of, uh, you know, he had to compromise. He worked in an ad agency, he hated it. Um, and he painted these, you know, very impassioned paintings. And, and I'll just tell you that there, there's this character art man who's his who he despises because, um, art man was kind of based on two people. It was very based on two people. Now I, now I have to say, Andy Warhol was a great draftsman, great designer. Um, I mean, he's a very talented man as a, you know, whatever. Um, but, you know, I, I, I also, you know, I also thought um, this is a lot of BS in some way. I mean, uh, uh, that, that this is about, that, that, that this is, um, but I, I, in, in retrospect, maybe I have a somewhat different view of him, but, but uh, basically the whole thing of, this this kind of um, marketing and Brillo boxes and this and and it's and um, it just was like uh, it seemed in some way a, a kind of a gimmick that that opened to another gimmick maybe it's a great truth too but basically part of the target for this was Andy Warhol and the other was Ad Reinhardt and Ad Reinhardt um, he was um, he was a when I when I was like third year I think in Cooper my friend Bill and I went up to the Jewish Museum to say Art um, Ad Reinhardt had a retrospective up there so Ed Reinhardt for those of you who don't know he did these paintings that these giant canvases that were completely black except for a like a light blue band I mean not just a, a subtly blue band and a subtly like kind of red band or a cool and a warm band but basically you look at them and basically they're all black, and we heard him give a lecture about his 12 principles of the ultimate painting. Now, he had been a colorful abstract painter early on, and he hadn't hit the He had also mark. drawn comic strips yeah, for yeah, PM comic Magazine strip, and he was a, And politically, he was an activist, and he was a really a great guy, actually. I just talked to somebody who'd been sort of mentored by Ad Reinhardt and loved him, and, and he came to Cooper and talked against the war one time with our teacher, Gwathmi, one time. But... Um, but, but aside from that, basically, we saw this show of all black paintings. Now, I'm in art school, and I'm full of passion, and I'm kind of 
some have some of Gustav in me, you know, and uh, <laughs> and this guy is saying, okay, these are the he's made the ultimate painting. He's black. This is where painting was always headed. Now we've arrived, and 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 these are the rules for for the new painting: no color, no form, n no uh, whatever, no feeling, no what. I mean, the whole it was like no nothing, you know. <laughs> so basically, I walked out of there wanting to kill myself, you know. <laughs> and so Art Man became a com combination of those two things. And of course, Art Man eventually was making invisible paintings. So that's. <laughs> Um, there's so much, one of the things, it's so interesting because I feel like there is something about this comic where um, it's really like, because you know, you call it McDoodle Street and it feels like it's really grounded in doodling and what I think part of what that also means is it's like grounded in the pleasure of the art experience. Yeah, well I, you, you, I, you, you very, very uh, perceptive of where I came from. I mean, yeah, the joy. You know, there's a there's a line I have in the in the in the in the addendum. There's a 20 page brand new addendum to the new McDoodle Street book because the people at um, the editors uh, Lucas and Gabe at um, NYRC they said, you know, McDoodle Street the storyline ends and then there's a there's several strips that kind of drift here and there and then the comic strip just goes away and doesn't come back and never comes back. So they said, would you write an addendum that would tell what happened at that point? And I did write this addendum, and in there, there is a quote from the sculptor Giacometti, which I found in Life Magazine in like my second year at Cooper. And the line was, I no longer work for anything but the sensation I have while working. And it's really that thing is like, if I don't feel it here, you know, then, then I'm bringing nothing, you know. And if I'm coming up with a gimmick from my head, and you know, whatever, like, okay, maybe, maybe people make some money. But I, you know, the only thing I can trust is that we we have this mysterious things we feel, and this is where it really, you know, need, needs to come from. And I know when I was in Cooper Union, there were certain abstract painters that were teachers, and there were certain extremely realistic painters that were teachers. And I remember this guy Kusumano, one of those those realists. Um, said what a lot of people said back then, because abstract expressionism was still pretty dominant at that point, and they were, and and they, so they had this notion of, well, how do I know if this is good or not good, you know? And the notion is, um, the notion was, well, I got to see how they draw the figure. If they can draw the figure, then it's okay, you know. Otherwise, you know, that justifies it. And I still feel like the thing itself is still the thing itself, you know. And I and I and I I, I felt like. Um, the person doing it, it has to be vital to them. You know, there's a line in uh, Letters to a Young Poet, Rilke, the poet says, a work, of gar a, a work of art is good if it has sprung from necessity. So there's some level where it's got to be vibrant to the, the, the person doing it. So yeah, and then the thing about doodling, you know, it's like um, about play, about let's have fun, about, you know, silliness, about, you know, so that, that doodle, you know, there. That's the end of that sentence. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I, I feel like in some ways when you kind of describe the um, the sort of like creative process of, of Malcolm Frazzle, like the poet who's like writing, you know, poetry about the sublimity of dishwashing. Can I um, read something here? Can I yeah. read just this? Can I read the first? Oh, yeah, I just want to read the Please first do. panel. Sure. Inside of this jar is a set of dentures. Inside of this man is a poem. To extract the dentures from the jar, one needs simply unscrew the lid and take them out. To extract the poem from the man, however, is a far more complex procedure. <laughs> yeah, and I, I always felt like in some ways he was like a kind of humorous metaphor for yourself as an artist. Uh, I could say, well, I, you know, I looked like Malcolm until like two weeks before I started doing McDoodle Street. I had... I had a full beard for nine years, and I had, I don't know if they call them horn, the glasses like you have. I used to have those kind of glasses. And, um, and then, um, when, then right at some point, I just shaved my beard, and I got like wire glasses. So then I looked, so then I didn't look like Malcolm anymore, but I was really, but he really was kind of me. And then there was, um, and, then, and then I have me in the comic strip sometimes, so I had no beard and I had like w wire rim glasses. And I, and I might as well say this now, I don't think I can get sued anymore. The villain in this comic strip was, was this, my high school geometry teacher, I changed his <laughs> name. And, um, and um, 
I, I, I didn't like my high school geometry teacher. <laughs> and and um, but he didn't really do the things that are in this book. But, but one time, the cli <laughs> climactic, in the climactic scene, one of the climactic scenes, very dramatic, uh, you know, frightening, terrifying, climactic <laughs> scene. Um, anyway, of that book, when that scene appeared in The Voice, I had a friend in Massachusetts, A.B., and he called me up and he said, what were you and Mr. Wilson doing fighting with each other on top of that hamburger sign? <laughs> <laughs> so. um. <laughs> you know, it sounds like that came out of necessity. Um, <laughs> as you mentioned, you know the the strip kind of ends, and this was like the the last page of the original series, McDoodle Street, and the last page of the new uh, of the first book edition that came out in 1980. And this was a small, smaller, relatively paperback book in the kind of typical like comic strip collection mm -hmm. sort of format. Now in this oversized book, you've done this new addendum that you were talking about. Um, before and you have you know the comic strip itself drinking at the bar and some of the characters and they use like the mystical whiskey bottle to kind of check in with you and well you know the comic strip has uh, been forgotten you know yeah. so he's he's drunk and he's in the bar and telling you know you would you 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 would have whatever it was <laughs> I used to be in the paper every week every single week huh you don't know me do you should I. 40 years, 40 years ago, you wouldn't have had to ask. Anyway. Yeah. Um, but, you know, and you talk a little bit about how there were some, like, big, just life changes that happened to you at the same time yes. that the original run of you, McDoodle Street ended. So you had initially intended to just, like, take a break and put the book together and kind of recharge your batteries and get back to it. Right. Uh, but then you had like some things that happened in your personal and family life that were disorienting and it took you some time um, to really, I think, get back the way you describe it to like rediscovering your joy in making things. I right. Think. Is yeah. that fair to say? It was, yeah. Um, it was basically, uh, well, McDoodle Street, I realized at some point that it was I, I kind of realized I just this was not a sustainable thing. I loved it. I hung in till I finished it. But writing a week to week, um, continuing story in a strip every week, um, it kind of took over my life in a way. And it was also, you know, if you you write like, um, uh, say, you write forty pages into a novel, and then you realize, well, in chapter three, if I could just change this one thing, I'd have, a, I, you know, and I could do this here, and then I could do that. You know, you couldn't do any of that. So you were committed week to week, and then and that created a certain tension. Like I better get it right this week for now, for the future, for you know all this. I had better, and it wasn't the best way to write a novel. And and uh, and I just um, basically I I just reached a point where I realized this was not a sustainable thing to do. And then and then what happened is I did all the the final. Um, uh, the cover and the title page and everything for the book, and I and I delivered the book, um, and uh, so and, and this was September twelfth, nineteen seventy nine, between three and four p.m. I delivered it to the to the publisher, and I felt this just great relief that just lifted off of me. Like now I'm ready for the next thing. So it turned out the next thing was a very difficult thing, but. It, you know, if, it, if, if this difficult thing had happened a week or two earlier, I would have been like in the middle of like this and it would have been, you know, but it was like the moment that I was released like that. I went home and found out my father died. He died just exactly in that period when I was delivering the, uh, the book, which made me feel like, you know, there was some invisible connection or something. It, it, anyway, felt like that. And then I was kind of in a really lost period for about six months. And, and I tried to start McDoodle Street again, and I just couldn't do it. And, and uh, so then um, I was at a panel discussion like this, you know, and uh, well, it was like three, there were four people at the School of Visual Arts, and they were talking. And at some point, as I often did in school, I, I, I pulled out this sketch pad like mindlessly, and I just, with a rapidograph, I just made this like mindless doodle on the page. And when at some point, when it, I don't know, I half thought, oh, it's finished. Did that, and I did. Um, uh, did anyway. I did like uh, I did about um, fifteen of them, and when the and when the, the talk was over, I realized I had actually had fun drawing, 
and uh, I hadn't had any fun in my work for six months, you know. So I went home and I looked at my McDoodle efforts and they just felt like these knots. And, I, and so I set that aside and I took out a 9 by 12 Bristol pad. I took out a rapidograph pen and I just said, I'm going to make a comic strip with one goal in mind. I don't care if it's funny. I don't care if anybody understands it. I don't care if anybody ever sees it. I just want to have fun doing it. So then I did the, uh, do you have that first panel or oh. not? Oh, well, well anyway. I have the thing that this shows your this, return. Yeah, that was board. when I returned. Yeah, they, I, this was one of the panels from that strip. Right. And it was kind of like, what, what, basically what happened was, I did that strip for myself. It was really fun to do it. I felt great about it. I did three that night. And then I just kept doing them and didn't show them to anybody. And I walk around with this bag and I, I had like about 50 of them after at a certain point. Nobody had seen them. And I was really enjoying doing them. And one night there was this, there was this woman that I was dating at the time. And um, I thought, hey, you want to see one of these? And I, anyway, I showed her the first one and she said, oh, this is great. Hey. And then the next one, she said, oh, these are great. These are great. I was astonished. I didn't know because I didn't know what I had. And um, so then uh, uh, about a week or so later, I ran into a voice um, copy editor and uh, we had coffee and, and I said, oh, you want to see these things? And she, like, she said, these are great. These are great. You, you should show these to David, the editor. So I made an appointment with David. David looks through and he says, oh, these are great, these are great. Um, when are you coming back? So, so then I came back and uh, that, that first, can you go back to that first sure. thing? Yeah, yeah. And this was one of the panels from that, from that first strip, the very first one I wrote. And this was, uh, and this was like kind of a public surrender. It was, it was kind of like, you know, uh, the, the, you know, take it or leave it. Like, like, because when I was working on McDoodle Street, I, there was a certain tension, you know, if people would, a lot of people would say, oh, this is really funny. And then I'd, I'd say, well, God, what, what's funny? What, how, am I, how am I gonna do that again? You know? and, then, and I got to a certain extent too aware of who was out there and, and, and uh, too self-conscious. Although I, I feel like I carried through on what I was trying to do to the end. But this was like, okay, take it or leave it. This is what I'm doing. And uh, this was like a public surrender. And I, I was very happy. They wanted a panel for the, for the cover of The Voice for when I came back. And this is what they put at the top of the, paper, the top of the front page. Stamity returns. And what I had written was, the passion had passed from his cartoons now. He was a self-conscious nothingness pondering a future as a hack. And, and this was basically like a public surrender. Like, I can't, I can't go on with the self-consciousness that I had. I couldn't go on. Um, you know, approaching it the way I did. I had to take risks. I had to experiment. I had to go beyond what I was doing in McDoodle Street and, and in order to get to just, you know, be able to continue doing it. So that, that's what that was. And I experimented in a lot of different ways with this. Every week, this comic strip was very different. You know, this, this, you can this see. was called cartoons, but with like I think three R's and. This three was actually R's. about my father's death. Uh -huh. the, uh, I did a few about death, different things like that. Yeah. yeah. Um, so you did this uh, experimental uh, strip for a while, I guess about a yeah. year maybe after having done McDougal. Yeah, I did Street it for, for about, about a year. Two years. Yeah. And then I got a phone call from the editorial page yeah. editor of the Washington Post, the intimidating. Miss Meg Greenfield. Yeah. And um, she wanted me to do a McDoodle Street version of Washington for her op-ed page. Yeah. And that became Washington. Mm -hmm. Washington. For a while in the Post <laughs> and the Village Voice. Yeah, it was, it was, it was 12 and a half years. It was yeah. in, the, in the Voice and the op-ed page of the Post. And then eventually it was in 40 newspapers, the Boston mm -hmm. Globe, the bunch of other papers. Yeah. I think, um, you know, I mean, you've done so much work. I mean, and I'm glad that we really focused on McDoodle Street mm -hmm. and, and the new edition today. Um, but, you know, and since then you've done so much. You've done Washington. One of the things that's interesting about Washington is I think by the time I would have become aware of it, it wasn't really so much as an alt week of an alt weekly thing as mm -hmm. I think I thought of it as like a magazine thing, maybe. Was it in? Oh, like well, what Newsweek, happened was in, in 1993, in 1993, 94, 93, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, Time Magazine, there was an editor that really wanted me there. And, and he... He made an offer, and then he made another. Anyway, he just he just kept he just kept increasing the the money, <laughs> and uh, and at some point, so finally I went for it. I had a two year contract, and and he actually gave me a signing bonus that was equivalent to his first offer, and um, so you know his first offer for a year. So it was a, so it was a huge thing. 
So I, I jumped. And then, uh, but then I was, uh, toward the end of that time, they kicked him upstairs and uh, changed editors. And, and I, so I wasn't renewed. But um, mm -hmm. it, wasn't, it wasn't as happy a time as the, my time in newspapers, I'd say. It was more, it, it, was, it was, you know, it was very corporate. And it was very kind of everything had to be approved. And it was a, it was a whole other world. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And the, the other place, actually, probably because I didn't have any of your children's books when mm -hmm. I was a kid. Um, so I think probably the very first place I ever saw your work, I think, is certainly the first time I remember seeing it, would have been in the New York Times book review. Right. Also, oh, yeah. For this a was, while. This is about Bob Dylan. He, when he was going to write his memoir, there was an article about how um, he, 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 was gonna, he couldn't remember a lot of things, so he was going to ask people about you know what happened in his life. I just like I just do part of. Oh yeah, it. Oh, yeah, I don't yeah. Know, I need yeah, you can just maybe pick it up and yeah, it'll, okay. let, me, let me help you. Okay. Yeah. Oh, I got. It. Uh, just be careful. No, I just want the wire does oh. may not go much. Farther. I just wanted to read one thing. No, no, just one little part of it. So um, let's see. He's saying uh, uh, he could read his old. He was trying to jog his memory, so he he um, he forgets. He forgot a lot of the meaning of his actual songs. So he decided to ask his fans for help. And then he says, so he's reading this one lyric. He says, uh, I was shadow boxing earlier in the day. I figured I was ready for Cassius Clay. You know, the, they was, he became Muhammad Ali, you know, later. Hmm, it's coming back to me. I said, and this is his, his, from his song. I said, fee, fi, fo, fum, Cassius Clay, here I come. Better check this out. So he goes to visit Muhammad Ali. Uh, according to this song of mine, I fought you back in the 60s. You remember me? And then Cassius, so uh, Muhammad says, hard to say, I fought a lot of guys. He said, well, according to the song, I might have used a different name. And then part of the lyric was, you might call me Terry, you might call me Timmy, you might, or, or Bobby, or Zimmy, or RJ, or Ray. And, um, and so Muhammad says, I fought, a, I, I might have fought a guy named RJ. So anyway. <laughs> Uh, and this was, was this a weekly strip this basically was monthly. about a it monthly? Was, it was once a month in the Times Book Review. A on monthly comic strip for about four books. years. Yeah. yeah. And for me, I mean, just as a kid at the time, it was like the only thing that made the New York Times visually interesting oh, because yeah. they didn't have a comic yeah, section somehow, like the other newspapers that we had they, in the house. Yeah. Somehow <laughs> they didn't pay me accordingly. Oh. I was carrying the paper for you. <laughs> right, right, exactly. <laughs> oh, yeah, they, the entire Somehow I didn't get that executive yeah, salary. I yeah. don't know, yeah. Um, uh, and you've done some other uh, kids' books since then. Um, one of the things that I saw that you did uh, within the last several years that really pleasantly surprised me was signage for... Um, a store in Soho called Sonos. That's yeah, they had me do these drawings for. Uh, they, it's still down there on um, Green Street, 101 Green Street, I think. This was their Sonos. Is this is their first retail outlet, mm -hmm. and they had these uh, these. They, they're still down there. They're like shaped like houses. They're listening booths, and the mm -hmm. last booth is all filled with my. The walls have my drawings on them, and they liked the drawings so much that they wanted to do ads with them. So they. They did this before the store opened, and yeah. then they and then and then they one time you know for three months it was on a, it's all over the shuttle subway. Well, yeah, that's the thing. And first of all, I mean, I remember walking down Green Street and seeing this and going like, that looks like Mark Allen Stanley's <laughs> work, you know. And, and with those kind, anytime I see anything that's like an advertisement or a kind of corporate identity thing, and I think I recognize the style, I always think I should check. They might have just hired someone to draw like that person, <laughs> you know, because that stuff happens. Um, but no, that was On your the work. subway, you know, part of, I did make a contract with them and part of that was that my my copyright my in my credit was going to be on everything so when they did yeah. it on the subway yeah they that's that appears several places on every on the outside and inside so yeah so you basically decorated an entire this is the shuttle that goes between 40 yeah, they Times blew Square up my drawing and grand yeah, central yeah. station and so your drawings are not just all over the inside, uh, I'm sorry, the outside of the train, but all over the inside. Like, these are the chairs. Is, yeah, and it's amazing how they, they had, you know, a guy from Seattle who worked on this or somewhere in Portland or somewhere called me up because he liked the drawings. And he, they had, they're the guys who made this stuff that they stick on there. And so he was describing it a little bit. But there's like, it would go around the seats and there's no warp or anything. It was, it was really, I don't know. I mean, it looks like it's on the 
the actual uh, thing. It was pretty astonishing. Yeah, it's a pretty incredible thing. And in a way, like this to me feels like the logical conclusion or something or like some kind of cycle <laughs> that begins with drawing the kinds of like city images that are in, you know, who needs donuts and, you know, the, the Times Square and village scene. And then the images, even in, in McDoodle Street itself, you kind of take some opportunities to draw these busy, yeah. you know, images of the city. And now you're like literally decorated the city, you know, <laughs> and it's like, and if someone wanted to draw the city, they'd have to draw your drawing of the city inside their drawing, you know? Yeah. So it feels to me like some kind of uh, cycle has been complete there oh, or well, something I, like that. I, um, I like the way you presented it. <laughs> <laughs> but the only next step would be for you to design a city and have someone build it to <laughs> specifications. Yeah, mayor hasn't called yet. Yeah. <laughs> well, I guess, I mean, we're, we're running low on time, but I wanted to ask you, um, what are you working on now? And do you think you'll um, do anything like McDoodle Street again in terms of a long-form visual narrative? Um, yeah, I'm working on two graphic novels, and one is a, um, is a Western format. You know, it's, I mean, my eyes are different than they were, and I'm, a, I mean, it's, I, two, the two people have seen what I'm working on. I have like six chapters, 65 pages. Two people who read what I have, think it's funny, et cetera. It's not, exa you know, it's, it's different, but it's, I, o I always wanted to write these kind of crazy, nutty novels. And so it's a Western, because I grew up watching Westerns, the whole form of a Western is very much um, part of my system, but it really takes a lot of departure. It's not a typical Western in, I'd say, in a lot of ways. It's, it, it has, there's a lot to it that is not typically a Western. So that's, so that's that, and that's kind of a, that's a kind of a comical, I'd say, Western. And, and then the other, uh, the other thing is more serious. Since I was a senior in high school, I've kept kind of voluminous diaries and, and, um, and I have anyway, many volumes. And um, so um, uh, I'm, I'm working on a, I've got about two chapters, 30 pages of a, of a kind of a serious personal story about a kind of a trauma as a teenager and then how I evolved, you know, from the, that. So that's, the, those are the two books I'm working on right now. And I, you know, generally uh, through, through the years, um, besides diaries, I've, I've written a lot of chapter ones and a lot of first page of chapter one or chapter one, two, three, or, you know, a lot of beginnings of a lot of things and, and a lot of notes and things. So I, I want to write more graphic novels, basically, is what interests me. Great. Um, we have a couple of minutes. If, does anyone in the audience want to ask a question? You, I saw you put your hand up yeah. before, so I wanted to make sure you had a chance. Well, I was saying, uh, when I was in art school myself back in the day, Dinosaur Age. I remember being on the subway and seeing um, uh, Spanish people reading basically a graphic novel. And we heard about it in school, too. And that was the only one I ever saw. Yeah, and there's one. It was foreign language, and it was, I thought, and I don't, I think we talked about it in school, that it was for people who were less educated, say? Well, you know, when we, when we were in, you know, when we were, when I was in grade school, they had those comics that were like, what were they called? I don't know. They were comics that were like text things or something. You know, do you ever, you know what those were? I forget. But they were like comics that told stories of history and things, you know, and they were, and it, it was, so, but they were for kids, you know, for like, they were, yeah, I, I can't remember what they're called. Yeah, I think that's maybe, that, maybe that is what that was or something. But anyway. But um, I, I do know, you know, like like um, what's the what's the guy that has all the adventure Tin Tin Tin, tin you know, like that, and and in, that's Belgium, right, where all yeah. that happens. I mean, that, like it, comics are huge there. I know in Italy, I think they they have a tradition of of that that was much more popular there. You know, I think art, you know, Art Spiegelman and uh, Francoise Mouly kind of were were more aware of that, brought more of that here, you know, and kind of worked at that, have, you know, that, that, um, you know, having more regard for, for comics, you know, I think art still doesn't like the word comics. He likes, you know, I mean, he doesn't like the, he doesn't like the term graphic novel. Right. He, he thinks comics are distinguished enough, but, um, but I think in, in Europe and, uh, in, in some places they were, um, there was a notion that this is really art or this is really literature, and we didn't have that for a long. You know, comics were going to spoil your brain, like, 
You know, I did a thing about Jack Kirby in this book that was, uh, they had, um, I can't remember the guy's name now. Who, uh, Masterful Mark. Yeah, Master, book and by, who was the, yeah, the guy who um, put it together. Um, I can almost remember. Monty Beauchamp. Monty, Monty Beauchamp. Beauchamp, yeah. And he, and uh, he, um, so I, I actually hadn't been very much into Jack Kirby. I barely really knew who he was. So I read about him and I did this, you know, six page thing. And that goes into the thing. A part of that story is about where the psychiatrist in the early 50s was trying to destroy the comics business and saying they're going to ruin your brain and all that. So we had all that going on while other cultures thought that was literature. So, Well, the other thing is, when I was a kid growing up, my neighbor was the inker for Walt Kelly. Oh, oh fantastic. He was in an apartment. Uh, was this so, in Connecticut? No, or, in New York. Oh, okay. So his name was George Ward. Oh, wow. And he was... He had two little kids, and we were always playing with his sons. We were all little huh. at the time. And he knew I liked to draw, so he would let me come and watch him ink. Oh, fantastic. Hmm. That is fantastic. And then he gave me the book when I was still uh -huh. about eight. Wow. Nine. I didn't understand one thing because it's a <laughs> southern accent. <laughs> right. Togo is a swamp critter. All right, southern dialect, and it's and also it's got a lot of political and cultural allusions. Yeah, well, Walt, Walt Kelly was in a, his own level. You know, I know my father was a member of the National Cartoonist Society. You know, he would bring me into New York sometimes to go around to the magazines. And once in a while, he'd bring me to a meeting of the National Cartoonist Society. And Walt Kelly was there. And, and um, Rube Goldberg was at the front table. And all the, you know, all these kind of guys. But anyway, Walt Kelly was in a category of his own, really. Well, you can take one more. Yes, sir. I just want to say I remember your spreads from the center of the voice. I remember uh, the Greenwich Village one. There's a couple of hippies bragging who's never been above 14 spreads. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Times Square guy selling roasted beef and stick, and there's a catcher Smith. <laughs> oh, that's great that you remember that. Oh, yeah, it was, it, yeah. I would just say that was that was about. Um, there, I think there were three guys, and one guy says, "I haven't been above 14th Street in in uh, like two years, and his beard is this long." And then I haven't been above, and then his beard is longer. <laughs> and the guy haven't been 14 years, and his beard, and that came from Frank Ash's uncle. Uh, Crescenzo, who had a, he was a, he was a super and a, and a, and a carpenter on, um, on um, Thompson Street. And he was a real character, but I remember he said, he said, when I was a young man, I'd go right half. Here. It's right here. Actually. Yeah. I can't yeah. see it, but it's these. And he three, said. I don't know if you can see the shape of the three beards, <laughs> the big beard, the medium beard, yeah. the small beard. Yeah. Crescenzo, Crescenzo said, when I was a young man, I would, oh. I would go halfway around the world to chase a woman Crescenzo said, when I was a young man, I would go halfway around the world to chase a woman. He said, now I wouldn't go above 14th Street. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to ask uh, your influence. Is there any particular cartoonist that, you know, affected your own work? Well, my no, you know, I avoided looking at crumbs. When 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 that when when the when the, the what's that what's the big when the Big Brother cover came out. Big with, Brother and the Holding my Company My friend Bill said, hey, cover. you got to see this. This looks like your work. And I took one look at it and I, and I didn't look at Crumb for 15 years. <laughs> I didn't want to have anybody say I was... But anyway, my influences... First place, both of my parents, you know, I, I, I took something from each of them and then Jules Pfeiffer, Saul Steinberg, Ronald Searle, and then when I got to New York, uh, George Gross. Those were those were like my my uh, uh, strongest influences. Okay. All right. Well, with that, please join me in thanking Mark for sharing so much with us today. Okay.